I created a Wii Tanks clone with C++ and SFML. I have seen many videos of people documenting their projects and thought that I should give it a go. This is from the perspective of a junior computer science student, so I am no expert by any means, and this is the first game I've ever made and the largest project I've ever worked on. I ran into many problems and just about every single problem was not something I expected to deal with, and in this video, we're going to walk through how I built it. Oh my god, oh my god I'm actually going to... WHAT?! I WON! Wii Play launched on the Wii's release day in 2006 in Japan and early 2007 in North America. It consists of 9 different minigames that show the capability of the Wii Remote. The original game has 20 main stages, plus 80 bonus stages for 100 in total. And Tanks has 9 different enemy types which are all denoted by their color. My game is basically worse in every single way, with only 10 levels and 5 different tank types, but my game lets you use a mouse, so it's objectively better. And here's a clip of me playing the shooting game, and if you think I'm any good, you have to subscribe. The first step was drawing some basic shapes to the screen, which was easy for me because the SFML template I used already did that for me. I then added some magenta squares to act as placeholders for the walls and implement a collision system. According to other videos I have watched, collision is supposed to be easy, but since I had no idea how SFML orients objects, this was way harder than I thought it would be. Needless to say, I got everything working after putting the ego down and reading the documentation, but my implementation was still far from perfect. Rotation would prove to be 10 times harder than collision. You would think after not being able to set up collision by myself, I would learn to consult the documentation, but unfortunately, I did not learn my lesson. No? The thing is, it's just like slightly off, like, like, look. <laughs> After enough struggle with rotation, I finally bit the bullet and did some reading. I have a habit of trying to force something to work when I should just learn how to do it right the first time. As it turns out, there's something called the pivot point, which is the point where the object rotates around. This point never moves, and by default, SFML sets the origin, which is the pivot point, at the top left of the rectangle. In this illustration, the top left example was exactly what was happening to my turret in the previous clip, but after learning about this topic, the turret practically rotated itself. After I solved all the rotational issues, I was able to finish the tank and move on to shooting some bullets out of the turret. I was dealing with the issue you see on screen for about 3 hours across 3 days, and for the life of me, I could not figure out high school level trigonometry. What are you aiming at? This felt like being gaslit because I swear to god that I thought I knew this stuff and started drawing hieroglyphics to justify what I drew. The solution was dead simple and all my drawings were for nothing. It turns out that using degrees instead of radians outputs garbage values when you use sine or cosine functions. High school level math, by the way. Bro, I'm a genius. I'm a genius. I'm actually a genius. I struggled with bullet collision for a while, but this was mainly due to me not understanding how to draw SFML shapes versus where their boundaries actually are. Eventually I got it working using magic numbers which helped make the bounces look good enough. Unfortunately if you play the game long enough there are edge cases where the bullet's bounce seems to jitter and skip a few frames. This is mostly due to the magic numbers from earlier, but in gameplay it is invisible, so please do not look for it. The actual collision algorithm is a brute force n squared check of all the targetable objects in the map every frame. There are a handful of intricate collision algorithms that optimize the checks so you can handle more objects without lagging, but I did not use these. My game doesn't have enough objects to create any lag, but objectively, my code does do a lot of useless checks every single frame. Let's take a real example from my gameplay and examine how many checks this one bullet has to go through every single frame. That was 58 individual checks, and on top of that, every single bullet needs to do that 144 times a second. So doing some basic math and accounting for only 3 bullets in the previous example, you get 25,056 checks every single second, and again, that's only for 3 bullets. Now it was time for the bomb. In the real game, the player and a few enemy tanks can place a bomb, and they explode after some time or if they're shot at. By this point, I was more comfortable drawing shapes and getting the bomb onto the screen was not very difficult. I also stole a function from the interwebs to check if a square and circle overlap on any point so I can detect if a bullet hits a bomb. My problems began when I started trying to implement tanks dying to the bombs. Whoa. This was my first time trying to work with smart pointers and figuring out me memory management in C++. I tried writing the code in many ways, but fortunately or unfortunately, I settled on using global vectors to handle the memory. This worked really well for me, and while I know it is the opposite of good practice, you cannot argue with the fact that it worked. 
It is finally time to move on to my favorite part, creating the enemy AI. Like I said in the intro, my game has 5 different enemy types, and before I talk about specifics, it's important to know that every tank has these common traits. Each tank tracks players directly, which means that there is no balancing bullet calculations. Each tank shoots on a random interval instead of methodically, and only shoots at the player when there is a direct line of sight with no walls in the way, so tanks don't shoot themselves with the wall. Moving on to the specific tanks, we have the brown tank, which doesn't move and is the least aggressive, the black tank, which moves randomly and is equally as aggressive as the brown tank, the green tank, which moves towards the player and is more aggressive, the yellow tank, which only has one bullet but can lay four bombs and always aggressively moves towards the player, and finally the pink tank, which is the fastest and most aggressive and also has a bomb. If you are familiar with object-oriented programming, you would probably do something like this where you have a base tank class and all different tank types derive from that base class. This way you can easily separate between all the tanks with the added benefit of encapsulation. Unfortunately, I did not learn how to do OOP and C++ at the time, even though I was already comfortable with the topic at this point. Instead, I made a lot of member functions that simply set the variable to the correct level of the tank. If you know anything about OOP and C++, you should know about the V table. And even though the outcome was very ugly code, I was not ready to learn about virtual member functions. The last bit of functionality needed are the 10 different levels. I created a grid system and planned out all the levels before implementing them in code. This was the easiest part of the project because I just needed to draw out the walls and tanks onto the screen and keep track of what level it was. I then created a level manager class which handles resetting all the data when a new level loads to ensure I don't have any memory leaks between the stages. The code in this class is also rather ugly but functional and it's quite easy to design and add a new level which is the goal for the class in the first place. By this point we have a completely functional tanks clone and it is time to move on to the art for the game. A side note, by this point I've been working on this project for about one and a half months for about an hour each day and even though I'm proud of where I got to, it's crazy for how long it took to get to this point. For the tank art, I used my newbie photoshop skills to draw some squares and place them on top of each other. The title screen was a similar story. I found a nice background on google and placed some text and shapes onto the screen. I think overall the, the game art actually came out really well. I added treads to give the game some character as the level progresses and worked on explosion animations for tank deaths and bombs exploding but didn't record this because I ran out of disk space on my hard drive. With that, the game is practically complete. Now I want to take this time to talk about the hurdles I had to jump over to complete my game. The largest problem I ran into was the dreaded segmentation fault. All this means is that I tried to access memory that was invalid in some way. This memory could have been out of bounds or deleted. My game still has unresolved memory issues and I would love to tell you what they are, but I am still not sure to this day what they are. By this point, I have heard of memory debuggers like Valgrind and Address Sanitizer, but I thought I could just figure it out myself and was reluctant to learn new tools because I just wanted the game to be done. 90% of my issues stemmed from the way I was applying textures to objects. For example, I was trying to apply a bullet texture to a bullet that was already deleted from memory causing a segmentation fault. Reflecting back on this, textures were my least favorite part of the process and I think I just wanted to finish the game so I stopped caring about all correctness and just fiddled around until something worked on my screen. This is a mistake I will never make again and I wish I had the footage to show you my struggle. The other big mistake I made was relying too much on magic numbers. I talked a little about this earlier, but magic numbers are basically constants in your code with no names. This makes your code less readable, especially when you have too many of them. People use them because they're quick and I personally love using the excuse, it doesn't matter because I know what they do. This quickly became my downfall as editing large parts of my code became a herculean task because you have no idea what any random number does and the only way to find out is through changing the number and testing. Alright, well, thanks for watching. This is my first time ever doing something like this, so I hope you all enjoyed. Hope you all thought it was entertaining. It might not be perfect, but I'm only going to get better from here. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, like the video, but most importantly, follow the GitHub. Okay, I want to flex to my recruiters and pretend like I know what I'm doing and I'm an important part of some coding community. Okay, and if you were here since my daily uploads, drop a bolt in the chat. I'm going to like your comment. Peace.